I'm serious, do you guys want to stand up and stretch? I would. <laughs> All right. So, uh, right, well, I, I am not a scientist, but uh, it was almost a decade ago that I envisioned almost exactly what Michael so, I think, thrillingly described just now. And I can't tell you how pleased I am to see that coming to pass. Um, that said, uh, you know, I am not really qualified to talk to you much about science, but I can talk to you about the extension of the ideas uh, that I wrote about back then. And so, I also want to sort of tie this to, so uh, I don't know how many of you know, but one of the things Greg is doing in the fall is working with some of his students who are going to be looking at the operational data that the Toronto government is going to be pushing out to the web. And they're going to be asking questions and trying to answer questions about what that means, what can we, what can we learn about, about government, about life in Toronto. Uh, and uh, one of the points that I make about that is that right now in the Gov 2.0 space, there is a meme that says effectively, government holds the data and we, the liberators of the data, will, will, will crash through and uh, force them to release it to us and then we'll be able to make sense about whatever's been going on in the mysterious uh, chambers of government, right? But, but my point is that we're actually all contributors of what we tend to call government data. We're all producers as well as consumers of the stuff. And so I've been doing a kind of an ethnographic study of how do not scientists but just ordinary people publish data. And uh, the domain that I've chosen is the domain of public events. So um, this is an information system that's in use in every city and town. Um, I saw lots of examples of it on my morning run around the neighborhoods in Toronto. And uh, it's very effective, actually. Uh, and it's very much more comprehensive than what is available online right now. I think if you do the experiment, so what I did was, I walked around my town and I took a photograph of every event poster that I could find on a kiosk or a shop window. And I collected them all. And then I went to the web and tried to find each one of those things. And relatively few of them were actually online in any form. And there was nothing like a comprehensive collection of all of those things. So the question that I've been asking myself is, uh, you know, why is this system working for people? Because what they're basically doing is publishing data and it's pretty effective. There's a low activation threshold. Anyone can walk up to a kiosk and stick something on it. Anyone can walk by and read it. Um, it's also not very useful, though, because the thing that I saw this morning about the Zen Buddhist breathing group, as I ran by, you know, I might remember uh, you know, a month later, but I probably won't, right? So we'd like to enlist the, the facilities of the online world in making this stuff work. Um, but, but more broadly, I am trying to uh, inculcate in everyone a sense of what does it mean to publish information online, because I think ultimately everyone in one way or another has a need and an interest in doing that. So uh, the, the system that I'm working on is a, is, a, is a kind of an aggregation system. So here we have a day uh, in, in the life of Keene, New Hampshire, a few years on, and uh, it's an aggregation. And what's happening is that events are flowing in from a number of different online sources. So there are a couple of services you may know of. One of them is called Eventful, one is called Upcoming. And these are services that anyone can go to, register, say, I know there's a venue in Toronto called the Mars Theater. I know there's this Science 2.0 event. You can post it there, right? Uh, what the system does is for a geographic location, says, you know, pick the center of Toronto, take a 10 mile radius, and give me what eventful says is happening within that radius and does the same for upcoming because these are two competing services and the union of them is, is uh, you know, more than the sum of the individual parts. Um, but what I'm really trying to motivate people to understand is that individually and as organizations and as small groups, um, it is now possible for you, the individual, the small group, the organization to be the direct authoritative source for this information. So you can publish an information feed uh, directly from your website and uh, you don't actually have to rely on a third party service. And in fact, I argue that you should do that for uh, a whole bunch of reasons. So uh, 
you know, you know, this stuff gets mixed together, organized by date, and it comes back out in a variety of data formats that can be repurposed in any way. The um, challenge that I am having with this system is that I can't get people to understand that it isn't a database, and I can't get people to understand that it isn't a destination site. What I want people to understand, because what it actually is, is a syndication hub. Right? It's, a sy it's a thing that orchestrates flows of information. But it's not intended to contain anything. It doesn't own anything. And it, it wants no authority. It only wants to be brokering connections back to the original authoritative sources. And uh, people resist this idea. And I've, I've thought about this hard for a long time. And I conclude that there are psychological problems here having to do with the abstractions that are involved in a system that works in the way that, well, that Cameron illustrated, right? You know, this, this, this way of wiring things together with feeds and connections that, uh, you know, I think probably a lot of people in this room have gotten familiar with and comfortable with is non-intuitive for a variety of reasons. You know, I think, it, and I think that's because actually it doesn't correspond to, to people's uh, physical experience of the world. You know, so, uh, you know, if I, t if, I, if, I, if I take three things and I put them in a bucket, you can see that the three things are in the bucket and you feel like they're there, right? If I give you a thing, I, I physically transport it and give it to you, right? But when we start passing around links and pointers and references and wiring feeds together, it gets abstract. And, and, and people are not, uh, not so good at this. So uh, actually, so this wouldn't be too interesting if it was just keen, but what I've got going now is a system where anyone anywhere can spin up an instance of this, right? So if your neighborhood, let's say, was the annex in Toronto, you could stake out a home. You could say, you know, the center of whatever I declare to be the center of that neighborhood is the center, some radius around that, uh, and then start looking for feeds to plug into it, and you would get an aggregation of events uh, flowing in from these various feeds for your community. So I've got um, people who I call curators who are in these different communities, and the notion is that a curator is someone who essentially makes a list of feeds and then makes this hub available to whoever wants to use the downstream information. Um, just by the way, so I'm building this on the Microsoft Azure platform, which is a cloud platform, not unlike uh, you know, Amazon's EC2, if you've heard of this, or, 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 or Google's equivalent to that. Um, and this is going to be very helpful because uh, you know, right now there's only 17 cities involved, and so I can actually sort of process all of the data you know, within a day, but at some point, I hope this gets more popular. I run out of hours in the day. And so I just you know, effectively say, run more instances of the worker role. And um, I don't have to think too much about that. Actually, I don't have to think any about it. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of convenient. It's, it's also not strictly geographic. Um, and this might be of more direct relevance to some folks here. So uh, there's another axis of aggregation, which is topical. Um, and uh, so uh, here we have someone who's uh, keeping track of e-learning events, which are online uh, webinars, right? But I have a friend who runs a bio-optics magazine, and I think that she's going to be using this because she's always trying to figure out, you know, where, you know, what are all the bio-optics events, and so I can put them on a calendar, right? The idea here is that uh, she can, again, instead of in the current model, which is everyone send your information about the events to me so that I can prepare the central database and then reflect it back out to everyone. Instead, it's everybody be responsible for your own stuff. And, uh, you know, so the, the, the set of things at the top of the slide are kind of mom and apple pie, right, in terms of what are the values of this project. It really is about transparency and open data and yada, yada. But, you know, I almost take all that stuff for granted. There's a couple things here, uh, though, that uh, bear, I think, more discussion. And one of them is about the notion of authoritative sources. Uh, and, and that kind of goes in two directions, and one of which is that I want, I want people, and you know, I want everyone, really, to claim authority over that which they are properly authoritative for. I want people to own their own stuff, and then I want uh, people to expect the world to link to their stuff, right, as opposed to expecting um, to give copies of stuff to other people. It's a, it's a kind of a, a key principle, and, and this notion of shared responsibility for the curation is uh, something else that, that, that we'll explore. Um, you know, syndication is a huge deal. I want people to understand that syndication is a two-way street. A lot of people have got the idea or are starting to finally get the idea 
that they can be consumers of feeds. They can subscribe to things. Not nearly enough people have internalized the, the, the converse of that, which is that you can and you should, in many cases, also be a publisher of feeds. Um, structured data and tagging uh, lead to some possibilities for things like emergent workflow. Um, I, I loved your example, actually, about the, the emergent taxonomy then being compared to the official one and you know, that there's information in the delta. That's a, that's a, that's a great example. Uh, and, and all this is uh, part of what I have started to talk about in terms of, it's not my term, but, but there are people who have noticed that there are ways of thinking and doing in the online world that incorporate patterns and practices which we could call computational thinking. I don't think that's quite the right word for it, but that these are, in fact, not patterns and practices and principles that are exclusively the province of mathematics and computer science, but are actually, in the 21st century, in a connected world, the kinds of intellectual tools that we really need to be giving to everyone and teaching to everyone and showing them how and why to use. And that's, that's probably the, the sort of ultimate agenda for this project. So, uh, you know, Greg talked about the, the book uh, that I did a decade ago. Um, you know, here we are 10 years later. And, uh, you know, I, I'm on to kind of a, another dusty internet standard, I guess, that I'm sort of finding unusual ways to make use of. But I don't, I don't really want to say that, that iCalendar, which is the, the internet standard that governs all of this calendar aggregation, I don't want to really say it's the new NNTP. I actually want to say it's the new RSS. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, we have now, or we're starting to become pretty comfortable with the notion of an RSS ecosystem. And, uh, you know, we have all these tools, WordPress, TypePad, et cetera, that we understand to be publishers of RSS feeds. We have uh, other tools that we understand to be readers or consumers of RSS feeds. And it's also fairly well understood that in the ecosystem, there are a set of things that aggregate feeds. And, uh, you know, so we have some some notion that when I put an endpoint out there, a feed, right, that it can be brought together in the context of other things, right, you know, and which could be, for example, uh, the set of blog posts or Twitter entries associated with this, um, with this conference, right, and there's just kind of a specialized aggregation, which is a consequence of a Twitter search that brings all of that stuff together. So we, we, we sense that these, these things are working for us and what, what it means to publish into an environment where this aggregation is happening. Um, and uh, we actually, it turns out, I realized about a year ago, have the same opportunity in the, in the realm of events, in the calendar domain. Uh, and, and it just hasn't really been exploited. Um, and in fact, the, the, the tools that are available to us here are, in a way, even more familiar, I would say, to many people than the initial wave of blogging tools were, because they are the very calendar programs that if people use calendar software to manage time-ordered information, are the ones that people use, right? So it is Google Calendar, it is Outlook, it is Apple iCal, and so on, and you know, Lotus Notes, et cetera, right? And, and by the way, all of those same tools subscribe to feeds, right? You know, so you know, some people have noticed that it's possible to, for example, uh, take the feed, if there is an iCalendar feed, from your local sports team and overlay that on your personal calendar or your work calendar and, and collate those events. Um, not, not many people do that, though. Um, the, 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 the other quadrant, though, is, is pretty sparse. Uh, you know, what, what, what the ecosystem or the would-be ecosystem currently lacks is an aggregator, a thing, you know, that weaves these feeds together in purposeful contexts. Uh, and so this thing I'm calling the Elm City Project after Elm City, which is my town, uh, it is such a thing. Uh, there is a, another project I know about called Calligator in Portland, but... Um, you know, I think that this is, you know, sort of a, a missing piece of infrastructure that I'm at least trying to kind of bootstrap. Uh, I don't expect to be the only or best one, but I'm trying to get the idea out there and get it going. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's a 10-year-old internet standard, but um, I, I think part of the problem is that it, 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 it sort of crept up on us that it was possible. Because people think about, first of all, they think about calendars in terms of personal information, but I find very few people thinking in terms of any sort of time-ordered information that is intended for public use, right? I want to, uh, you know, announce my series of talks, or I'm a musician, and I want to, you know, project the calendar of tour dates that I've got out to the web in a way that people can syndicate reliably, right? That just doesn't seem to occur to people. Um, partly, I guess, because it's relatively recent. You know, we've had these tools around for quite a while, 
But it's, it's kind of a subtle thing. Only fairly recently did it become true that in, let's say, Outlook, uh, you could not just export your ICS file to your local hard disk or you know, push it to a network server, but you could um, export it, upload it into the internet where it can be subscribed to. And uh, this, this is not, not really well appreciated, and it's kind of, it's kind of key to this, this, this strategy. So this, this I call the, the tyranny of the technologists, right? And it's, so here's the deal. There's, a, there's a, a, a website in the academic world, and they have a thing called the events page. And they had the notion, because you know, some of us in the technology world have been beating people over the heads for 10 years now about RSS feeds, right? So they had the notion, well, this is data, and I'm publishing it to the web, so there should be a feed. So yeah, I'll put an RSS feed, and I know it should have an orange icon, and it should be RSS, right? So now I have a data feed out there. Well, um, but when you look, <laughs> right? This is, this is the data feed. Well, there's no data in that data feed, right? This is, the, you know, in, in, in a calendar information feed, you would expect, you know, time, date, location, right? Well, party on the text. Go, go you know, go figure it out, right? It's not there. And, uh, you know, so I, you know, what to me this says is that in some ways we, we think that we have trained people to operate in these pub-sub, you know, syndicated environments, but in fact, I think in many ways, we've given them patterns without understanding of underlying principles, right? So this, in my view, says, you know, I, I, I've memorized a pattern, right? And I'm going to use that pattern in this case, you know? But there's no understanding, right? I mean, what was the point of it, right? The point was to communicate data. And this does not do that. Um, so, so what do you do if you want to be the curator for the annex? in Toronto or anywhere else. Well, so this person is the curator for Prescott, Arizona. Her name is Susan Gerhardt, right? And so you, you basically make up a delicious account. Uh, so delicious in, in the system serves as the uh, metadata, uh, which is to say like the configuration file for your instance of your aggregator, and uh, the registry of feeds, right? So she became Prescott AZ on delicious. Um, and then in step two here, there's a, a, a little trick that we do where we pretend that there is a thing called delicious.com slash Prescott AZ slash metadata, right? Well, that doesn't actually exist. It's just an imaginary URL. It's actually, I guess you could say a URN, universal resource name instead of location. Um, you know, and that's just a hook, right? That's just a, that's just a, a, a place in the cloud where we can hang metadata. Um, and so what you actually do is you invent this URL that doesn't exist, and you bookmark it, right? And then uh, you tag it with metadata. And so, you know, to your point about, about name value pairs, right? Um, there's just another little trick here, it turns out, that you can do where um, if you don't include spaces in the tags, then the where equals Prescott comma AZ as, is viewed by Delicious as, as a tag, right? But the system can figure out that it's really name value pairs, and so you get to put um, this kind of metadata into, into delicious, which is incredibly geeky, I understand, right? Um, and I, I'm really conflicted about this, and I know that at some point it will be necessary, and maybe some of the software carpentry students who gave a stunning set of demos, you know, will, uh, you know, one of them will want to tackle the writing, the, the, the actually useful and friendly front end to this. But, um, you know, uh, for whatever reason, I like the idea of exposing people to this idea in its raw form, just like you were doing in, in your case, because, because the notion that you can manufacture vocabulary and that in, a, in an agreed-upon way then use that to basically construct applications in the absence of software, right, just by, just by willpower and consensus uh, is, I just think, interesting and, and important. Um, so, so then, uh, you know, Susan goes ahead and she bookmarks the different feeds that she can find in Delicious, and that's basically the list of things that get aggregated. Um, and, you know, there's some more uh, consensus vocabulary going on here where you say, uh, for example, that a thing is a trusted feed, and that's what gets it into the aggregation, right? And if you sort of, if you didn't say that it was trusted, it could still be, you could sort of have a scratch pad and keep track of it but it wouldn't get aggregated, right? So that there's a, actually a query that you have to issue that involves tags to get the thing through. So 
you know, this wouldn't work if everyone, obviously, in a community had to do it. But it turns out that you only need one person for a whole community to, to do this. So for now, as, in spite of the, the, the ugliness of it, it that this, this doesn't seem to be the, the, the obstacle, right? The obstacles are elsewhere. Um, these are, here are the trusted feeds. Uh, and some more metadata around URLs and categories, right? So, I'm, but I'm not, I'm not religious about this. You know, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm perfectly open to any other way that people are happy to agree to manage the metadata for this stuff, right? It doesn't matter to me. I'd be happy to do it in all of these other ways. You know, but what, um, what I like about Delicious for the time being anyway is it is this radically open kind of infrastructure, and it enables a variety of useful effects. And so uh, here's one of them, actually, is I, I thought about um, how am I going to get the group of people who are my curators together to be aware of the status of the project and to be aware of the contributions that one another are making and to get a sense of the momentum of the project. And so, you know, I thought back over the long catalog of collaborative systems that I've used in the past. And, you know, blogs, done that, wikis, done that, you know, yada, yada. Um, and uh, I actually realized that the perfect solution was friend feed, right? And um, so the, the reason for that is that in the friend feed room, which is now the collaboration space for the curators who are involved in this project, um, I am in a, in, in a sort of an echo of the theme of syndication of the project itself, right? I am subscribing to, first of all, all of the delicious feeds from all of the curators. And not just to those feeds, but I am subscribing, in fact, to queries within those accounts. And so the bottom line is when Susan in Arizona finds a new calendar feed and adds it to her delicious account, which then makes it show up in the Prescott, Arizona aggregation, the guy in Huntington, Virginia is like, oh, you know, Susan found a new feed in Arizona, right? In other words, events that occur in the life of the project uh, propagate into a pub sub network, a network of feeds, right, and, and, and just percolate, you know, automatically and become available and are made aware, people, and people are made aware of them, right, uh, w with no additional effort. And that's, um, you know, that's the kind of a thing that really makes, for example, Facebook what it is, right? You know, that what actually I claim Facebook is doing is training people to have the expectation that as they operate in online spaces, the, the actions that they take produce what I would call, and, and to its credit, friend, uh, Facebook does not call a feed, right? But my activities within my circle of acquaintances in Facebook are actually firing events, you know, in, in some sense. And the people in my circle of acquaintances naturally just become aware of those events, and it's bidirectional, right? So I become aware of their activities too. Um, what, this is, what this is showing you is that you can invent those kinds of systems with the kinds of tools and systems that are lying around on the web right now and make this happen. I know, Michael, you're a huge friend feed user, and I've seen you do some of these same patterns, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really powerful, but, but it, it's, it's powerful because everything else in the environment is a service and is feed enabled, right? So the other stuff that syndicates into this friend feed room is, for example, any post on my blog, but not just any post on my blog, but ones that I post to my blog that are tagged as being about this project, right? So my narrative about the project also flows in, right? My status updates on the software also flow in. And there's, there's just not any effort required. It's in the architecture of it. Um, right, so, so where do we get these iCalendar feeds? Um, sometimes curators can find them. One of the most fruitful sources right now are actually the kinds of Google calendars that you may have seen embedded in web pages. So if you ever see a web page and has a Google calendar widget in it, unbeknownst to, to probably, almost certainly unbeknownst to the creator of that calendar, there is an iCalendar feed uh, whose URL can be deduced. It's not actually made evident to you, but there is one. So you can take that data in mechanically, but mostly, um, the information that's on the web that people think of as calendar information is not in any kind of structured format. It is not amenable to any kind of feed syndication. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I say the iCalendar ecosystem, if there is even going to be one, is kind of in its infancy. It's maybe where we were, uh, almost at the dawn of, of RSS. Uh, so, 
you have to have a kind of a guerrilla approach to this stuff. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I do is point out to people that they may already be running software that has this capability, and they just don't know it, right? So in that case, you know, you, you walked up with the, to the person who's running the Drupal content management system for your local, uh, you know, dance studio and say, did you know that your calendar actually could be aggregated into this community calendar? And they say, no, I didn't. Well, actually, I've done it for you. I just bookmarked this URL. So see, here's your stuff. And they think, oh, cool. Um, but, you know, but, but uh, mostly it's, it's, it's much harder than that, right? So for a while, I was uh, making use of a service called FuseCal. FuseCal was a thing that very cleverly read web pages and kind of figured out how to turn um, you know, the stuff that people publish. This is up here on the left, what people think of as calendar information on the web, almost universally. Um, and down there on the right is what machines understand to be calendar information, right? And uh, this, this service called FuseCal was arbitraging the difference. It did a pretty good job, not a perfect job, um, of kind of figuring this stuff out. So a bunch of curators got excited about that. A bunch of them went and pointed this thing at, at all kinds of web pages. Um, I actually came up with a recipe for, uh, for MySpace, right? So uh, you know, one of the points about the, the social networks, Facebook, MySpace, and so on, is that people are actually putting a lot of event information into these systems, but you can't get it out, right? You know, because the incentives aren't really aligned that way. So you can't get a calendar feed out of MySpace. You can't get one out of Facebook, right? So I actually uh, came up with a recipe here to point this FuseCal thing at a MySpace page and get a feed out. And I thought that was cool, um, you know. But at a certain point, and, and this actually kind of goes to to the dark side of services, right? Is uh, is that services? Um, you know, the more of them that you depend on, the more vulnerable you are to bye-bye service, right? So this thing went away, and uh, it shot some holes in some people's carefully constructed calendar aggregations, you know, which is a nice object lesson in, uh, you know, why it is actually, let's recall, you want to be responsible for your own stuff if you can, right? I mean, you know, if, if it's too much trouble for you to actually use a calendar program to write down your calendar information so that you can reliably provide it to the web and you, re you know, instead lean on some service that's going to read your web page, um, you know, this, this is likely to be the result, right? So if you care about your stuff, um, you know, maybe you care enough to not put yourself in the position of allowing that to happen. Um, this, is, this is a little experiment that I did where I searched for the kinds of language that people use when we talk about recurring events, right? So, you know, we have a dance every first and third Saturday kind of thing, right? And if you search for those kinds of phrases on the web, plus the location of the town that you live in, you will find an astonishing wealth of information, which is effectively, you know, people telling you about stuff in a way that you can't make any use of, right? Um, in this particular case, this is a PDF file that was indexed by Google or Bing, I don't know which, um, in, in which the information about the fact that the Square Dance was at the Recreation Center was in an image as a, as a caption. And the information about the, about the time and date was in, uh, was in also a caption of an image, right? So this is, this is not actually a problem that you're, in my opinion, going to be able to throw AI at anytime soon, much to the chagrin of those computationally minded of us who would love to be able to do that, right? This is actually, in my opinion, a problem that's going to require a combination of crowdsourcing and of AI, data mining, text mining kinds of things. Um, and so uh, I guess I'll just mention here that I haven't done this part of it, and if anybody is interested, um, I'd love to, to work with you on that, on, on, on a sort of hybrid approach. But uh, how many people saw a thing that, uh, that Andy Bio did a little while ago where he analyzed some data off of Wikipedia about the uh, Feed the Animals mashup? Did anyone see that? Okay, so do, do people, are people familiar with MTurk, Mechanical Turk, the, the Amazon system that effectively farms out uh, tasks to the web that from a programmer's perspective look like web services, but on the back end are human beings doing the tasks, 
right? So, so, so Andy uh, wanted to do some data analysis, and he basically wanted to look at, uh, you know, who were all the contributors to the, you know, there's 200, 200 tracks mashed together in Phoebe Animals. And uh, Andy was able to scrape a Wikipedia table and get most of the data, but what he wanted was the, the publication, the release date of, uh, of each tune, so he could actually include that in his data visualization. So um, he took the, the, the 200 rows that he'd gathered from Wikipedia, and he batched that out to Mechanical Turk as the question, you know, times 200, right, one, one per task. You know, what, you know, when did this tune come out? And he, and he sent it out to the web, and in, I think, a couple of hours, and for $13, he had his answers, right? So um, a, a, bit of a, a bit of a segue, but I think that, that there's, there's some creative thinking here around services and components that needs to involve um, the use of human beings and human attention. And, you know, Michael sort of alluded to this in one way. This is a different way, right? You know, I mean... You could, you could potentially, uh, you know, in some cases, not need expert attention. You just need a lot of uh, a particular kind of attention, and, you know, this is, this is becoming possible, too. Um, so, you know, here's a site that's a, a downstream uh, uh, receiver of the information that's being aggregated for Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, here is uh, something that I did for my community that um, kind of gets back to my idea that uh, you know, where, where are people in the real world actually looking for information and actually finding it, right? And um, we know that one of the places is the kiosks that they see walking around town. Another one is actually television, right? So I, I actually decided that, uh, you know, one of the outputs of this system should be the ability to flow these feeds about what's happening today in my town to television. So this is actually a feed that uh, has been displaying on my local public access cable television station. Um, and just, uh, you know, just a point there about those of us who live in the web too much, losing track of where the real world is. Um, and then I just kind of want to talk through, I've been in a way kind of doing, I guess, a sort of ethnographic research about uh, how people deal with this stuff. And uh, so one of my favorite examples is this one. Um, my local newspaper was publishing the right time but the wrong location for a Monday Night Chess Club. Reason being that uh, it had moved uh, to another place, and so I was able to include the correct location via a feed. Um, and ha you know, in this case, I was actually acting as a proxy for the the, the, the chess club person who sponsors the event. But the, the idea, obviously, is that the person would be publishing their own information, right? They would not be relying on the newspaper to which they would relay a copy of the information, and then when it went stale, would have to remember to refresh the copy that they gave to the newspaper and refresh the copy that they gave to potentially, you know, any other publishers. Um, and, and there's really, I think, two related problems here. And one of them is, you know, that the, that the person in this case, who is the authoritative source for the information, does not have the expectation that he or she can be, in a real, live way, the authoritative source. Um, and, you know, this is why, actually, um, in, in, in the aggregation, I, I don't even keep very much information. But the one thing that I always get and transmit is a link. Because my idea is that I want, I want people to be able to put information in a place where it will come to the attention of the community whose attention they seek, right? But in then such a way that people will link through and find their original source and evaluate the information in that context, right? Um, so people don't themselves understand that it's possible or are not demanding that, uh, that their authority be respected. And, uh, you know, neither on the other end do newspapers in this case expect this, right? So. I'm having a difficult series of conversations with as many different local newspapers as will hear me out on this subject about the notion that, all right, you, you guys have figured out what it means and why you want to publish feeds. I'm asking you to think about being a consumer of feeds, right? I'm asking you to, to, to think that your constituency, your readership are, in fact, the co-creators of 
the rich information that you could be putting together. And, and by the way, if you had more of that rich local information, you would have flow and you would have the business model that you feel the web has taken away from you. So um, those conversations aren't going very well. Um, but I'm trying. Um, so then I had this painful conversation with my high school principal. And you know, this is in 2009. Right? This, is, this is the calendar information that, and this is not unusual, that Mike High School chooses to publish to the web. Right? Weekly.pdf. You know, it looks like, actually looks like it was done on a typewriter somehow, but it's, it's, in, a, it's in a PDF file. Um, and uh, you know, there's just so many things that bother me about this. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, I, it, you know it, isn't just, it isn't just that they're doing this, right? It's that, and it isn't just that, that, they, that they don't understand what the kind of alternatives would be, but it's much more that they're not teaching anyone what the alternatives would be and what that would mean and why. And, and this kind of goes to this point about, about computational thinking and its relationship, you know, uh, I think what it, its relationship should be to, uh, you know, K through 12 education, never mind universities. Um, right? So, uh, you know, this is, this is an intelligent guy. This is, this is a professional person. He's not a dummy, right? Um, and, he's, and he's not unusual or atypical. But he has, to a degree that I think people in the, in the space of you know, the web and computers and software and information systems, those of us who sort of live in this world, I think we really don't have a clue about the extent to which most people who aren't us have no intuitive sense of the difference between writing those words in a PDF file and putting this fielded information into some kind of a data feed, right? There is, there is, you know, it's a computer file, right? I put it on the web. It's information, it's data. You can use it, what's the problem, right? This is, this is distressing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it, it bodes poorly for a lot of social initiatives that are, you know, going under the rubric of, let's say, government 2.0 right now, where the idea is that we're going to have all these data literate citizens cooperating in the analysis of, of, of civic information. You know, I, I don't think that we're building the basis of that understanding, uh, really, very much at all. Um, so, you know, more of these kinds of principles. Um, indirection, right? This is, this is one of those, uh, non-physical kinds of things and, and, and therefore non-intuitive kinds of things, right? Um, you know, why do people send email attachments instead of links is a question that I have been asking myself for a long time. I, mean, I understand it's a little bit more complicated, it's a little bit more indirect, right? Everyone in this room also, I think, appreciates the many benefits that flow from the more indirect approach, right? But, um, you know, if you're a computer science type person, you know, the difference between passed by reference and passed by value, right? A pointer to the thing versus a copy of the thing. Well, we've, we've internalized that long since, right? We don't really stop to think about it. And again, we don't stop to contemplate the extent to which most people have not really been exposed to that idea or encouraged to think in those terms and what the implications of that are, right? Um, syndication, similarly, right? Uh, syndication, uh, in particular of data implies structure. If you have no notion of structure, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be at a handicap. Abstraction is another one of these kinds of things, right? Um, you know, we can choose arbitrary vocabulary and then work effectively in an online context based on nothing but that, right? And um, this is a pattern that has a variety of uses and is something that is, uh, you know, not understood, not taught, not exploited. And this idea of query as a kind of a first class object, I think is also kind of important, right? One of the, one of the reasons why, I would have to say that Delicious is, has, of all of the changes in my own personal information habits in the last, say, four years, has been the single most dramatic. And the, the reason is, actually, it's, it's actually this, right? Someone will say, you know, what have you written about blah? And my answer will be delicious.com slash judel slash tag plus tag, right? 
I answer the question with a question. The question is a URL. The URL is actually a query uh, into a database of stuff that I've tagged intentionally. Um, and when I give you that answer, I'm not doing what I would have done at any time prior to that, even probably five years ago. And what I think still largely occurs today, which is I will you know, write down a list of things that I know I've done and give it to you. Right? I give it to you. I take a copy of it and give it to you because psychologically it feels like I have satisfied your request right? by transporting a thing you know, from my possession into your possession. Right? It doesn't, you know, handing you a pointer, it feels different, right? It's, it's, it's abstract, right? But, but all of these benefits flow from that, right? Like uh, when I add to the list and you resolve that URL in the future, you have a longer list, right? And uh, anyone else who is paying attention to that URL has the exact same benefit. And by the way, you can determine who were the other people who were paying attention to that same thing. And there can be discovery of social context that flows from that. All these things. Uh, you know, flow from this stuff, but we don't, uh, I don't think we just make these principles very manifest to people. Um, <laughs> apologies to people who saw this uh, last night, but it's, it, it's actually, I'm, I'm not kidding about this. Um, you know, I, I have uh, some hope that it's actually sinking in when I see this, right? This is, this is a case, look at, look at what Lindsay Lohan does in this, in this instance, right? You know, she, first of all, um, publishes something in her own space on the web, right? It's on her Twitter account. And so she says, you know, here's an artifact that I am presenting to the world, right? You can all link to it, right? I'm not sending it to you, and I'm certainly not sending it, you know, through intermediaries, right? I am directly owning and am responsible for this stuff, number one. And number two, right, that by being intentional about my use of metadata in this thing, Right? I can uh, control or influence the network effects that it causes and that result from that. Right? I, think, um, I, I think that's a kind of computational thinking. And if, uh, if she can do it, I, I wish my high school principal could. And I wish he could teach, uh, I wish he, he could be teaching it. Um, so, so this is a guy that just showed up. And I found him on the Keen calendar on a Friday, you know, some Friday he was going to be playing in Keen. I'd never heard of him. He just popped up at 7.30. And uh, I clicked through. In this case, the, the event syndicated in from Eventful because uh, I'm casting a net around my location for things in Keen. And uh, indeed, he had been on tour and he posted, you know, a 20-city tour to Eventful. And, uh, in, in, and by doing so, and in combination with the fact that uh, you know, my location was listening to that virtual feed, namely the virtual feed defined by events within a, 20, a 10 mile radius of Keen, right? those two things came together. And he showed up on our calendar and had, I am sure, no knowledge that that even occurred. Right? In other words, the right thing happened. The thing he would have wanted to happen in all of the other cities that he visited, right? which is that without any additional effort on my part, I am publicized in all of the 20 cities that I'm going to be touring, right? As opposed to, again, you know, I have to work through intermediaries. I have to find uh, the public relations professional in each one of those towns who uh, knows how to get to the gatekeepers, right? And send, you know, send the PR blast and then follow up on that and, and so on, right? And in fact, in order to be able to do that, I need a lot of resources and a lot of money. Um, and, and so this is what I mean by a kind of shared responsibility for curation, right? This wouldn't have worked um, unless both parties were involved, right? You know, somebody was publishing, somebody was subscribing, um, and, you know, the connection got made. And I think that this, um, well, I know that, that this is broadly applicable, and uh, so this is what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm trying to work with uh, a few different kinds of entities on this. Um, I talked about newspapers, haven't come out upon them. I think this is a huge opportunity for them and for their communities um, in, in a lot of ways. I'm trying to work with libraries, because libraries, I think, can be also natural curators for this kind of community information. And I'm trying to work with schools, uh, including maybe some of you folks, on a few different things. Um, the 
user interface piece, the crowdsourcing piece. But most of all, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to get these ideas out there in a broad way because this, you know, for me is not just about the domain of public events. It is about, uh, you know, the underlying principles, practices, and patterns. And I think that, and I know that, uh, you know, we're seeing effective use of them increasingly in your world. I don't see nearly enough effective use of this stuff in the wider world. And I think that, um, and, and I think it just matters, right? You know, I think that, that uh, I think it could be a big deal. I do. Anyway, thank you. Hi there. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment a little more on the, the tension about using third-party sites. Because you, you talked during the, the FuseCal example of the difficulties there, but then a lot of the computational thinking examples about using indirection and using you know a link to a website with the file or putting a link to Delicious, yep. which I think, I mean, I agree with you completely, but in doing that, you've then opened yourself up to if Delicious goes away, well, you know, five years from now, what happens to your list? Or Absolutely. Or the examples from earlier with the open um, lab notebooks, if Flickr goes away in 10 years, what happens to the raw results from my you know, experimental machine that's been uploading to there? So I just wonder if you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's actually a huge point. So, you know, for what it's worth, first of all, I, I uh, actually am, in effect, caching all of that delicious information in the Azure system, right? So, uh, you know, that's there, right? But yeah, that's a huge, that's a huge paradox that we face right now. Um, you know, we want and need to be in the cloud on the one hand, and yet we fear the cloud for, you know, obvious and, and, and valid reasons. And, uh, you know, this is a, 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 a line that we're going to be trying to walk for, for quite a while right now. Um, I think that uh, let's put it this way: I want I want people to have a choice ultimately of. Let me rewind. There's a, there's a piece of this that I haven't gone into, but but I have this notion that that what I want for my stuff is a place in the cloud that is ultra reliable and ultra secure, right? And that ultimately cannot be provided by any one service or any one business because ultra-reliable and ultra-secure means that, uh, in fact, if I choose to pay for it, I can have a service which will reliably offer me even a multi-generational guarantee, right? And if I don't choose to pay that much money, I'll have a, you know, sort of five to ten year comfort zone, and if it's free, it's free. Take your chances, right? Um, I think that, you know, what, what I envision happening is that we will have that sort of a range of choices along then a, a number of axes, right? And, 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 and part of this is about getting people to separate some concerns from one another, right? So, uh, for example, uh, storage is a separable concern from social interaction, right? So, you know, why should I give Flickr my photos, right? Actually, I don't think I should. I think that I should have the choice of storing my photos in you know, a repository that is as secure and long-term reliable as I care to pay for, right? I think that there should be an ecosystem of interoperable services that make that menu of choices available to me. And I think that Flickr should syndicate that stuff as it needs to in order to do the social piece of what it does. I don't want Flickr to be my archive. I don't want WordPress.com to be my archive, right? I want them to provide the corollary services of interaction, reputation, and so on, right? Um, that's, a, that's a bigger picture, longer discussion, and there's nothing on the horizon, really, about that. But I'm glad that you asked that, because it's really where this is going. And, and, and that, that separation idea is another one of these things that will be conceptually very difficult for people, right? Because, I mean, you know, I don't think very many people at all 
would be even comfortable with the notion that, well, of course, I mean, they're in, they're in Flickr. My photos are in Flickr, right? Yeah. I wonder if you could say a few words. I mean, having experienced people sending me information about an event in an email where they attach a Microsoft Word document because that's what they're familiar working with, right? So if we think about sort of the general populace, could you just say a few words uh, about what you think about the prospect of getting people to get in the habit of putting things out as tags, uh, especially in the light of uh, the fact that if they were to do it, you know, sort of by hand, it would be twice as much work because they'd have to write, you know, twice as much stuff when you think about the normal length of a date message. Yeah. Uh, and what tools might be out there to help people do that and, and what the prospects are for getting people in the habit, you know, regular people in the yeah. habit of doing yeah. that. So, so I don't think it's a tools issue and I don't think it's a formats or protocols or standards issue. I think it's an attention issue, right, to, to sort of Michael's point. And there are ultimately certain hubs of attention, natural focuses of attention in communities that people do care to appear in. Right now, that's, for example, the newspaper. It's the local TV. It's, you know, a popular local website if there is a popular local website, right? Um, people desperately want to be in those places. Right now, those places haven't established a model that says, yeah, we want you to be in us too, but we see that it's better for both parties if we syndicate your information as opposed to, you know, copy, paste, retranscribe, and so on, right? In Huntington, as a matter of fact, um, the example I showed, my understanding is they have a person who full-time receives emails, you know, from the send us your events link on the website and transcribes them, right? So, you know, what I would say to them is, look, I mean, you know, if you agree to consume a registry of feeds, if you invite the people who are, in fact, already contributing the stuff to you to contribute it to you in this superior way, right, then that person, gee, I guess maybe they could be writing a feature story about the most interesting event that showed up every day, and maybe your newspaper would be, you know, a lot more interesting, and maybe I'd even want to pay for it, right, or advertise in it. So that's, you know, right, it's not, and this is another part of the, what I call the geek disease, right, is that we want the stuff to be about tools and formats and protocols, but really it's about, it's about social structures, it's about, you know, uh, who, who do people care about, who, you know, who do people want to pay attention to them, in what form, in what context, more than it is this other stuff. Thank you all. I know it's been a long afternoon. I hope it's been a very entertaining and hopefully fruitful one. Just before we break, um, if anybody has seen a white MacBook with Firefox and Cowboy Ninja Bear stickers on it, it's mine. I'd like it back. All right. Second thing, and probably more important to everyone in the room except me, I'd like to thank the people who made this possible. A bunch of undergraduate volunteers who got you all registered. Um, Professor, or sorry, Dr. Jen Dodd, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but did most of the heavy lifting to make this happen. I'm really glad for that. Um, and I guess most importantly, our speakers, um, five of whom are still, some of whom are still with us, some of whom have already realized that the bar is open. So one more round of applause for them, please. <laughs> and then I'd like to close by thanking the sponsors. Um, my tax. Uh, I believe we have a couple of my tax representatives here, here in Ontario. Uh, Sibera out in Alberta, where all of this is also being broadcast. Uh, Professor Steve Easterbrook, um, the wonderful folks at Cynet, and an anonymous donor who uh, chooses to remain anonymous. And a special thanks to the people at Mars who gave us this space. Um, I've, I'm very grateful to them for making this possible. If they could have fixed the weather, they would have. There's only so much you can ask. So thank you all for being here today. I hope you enjoyed it. The bar is now open. Uh, please go and take advantage of it. Thank you. <laughs>